comic book school if it's tuesday you know that can mean only one thing and it is time for comic book school live glad you're here because tonight we have an episode that is chock full of depressing information and saddening news to join us mike fasolo we're going to be talking about just not great stuff tonight right it's a very very somber episode somber it is a somber episode and we shall be equally somber tonight uh since it is hat month i am wearing my mustang hat this was given to me by my wife and children uh i own a mustang and um i have much mustang uh paraphernalia nice i used to own a mustang um back in the day i did a little uh 77 mustang you did yeah i never knew that about you yeah, that was my first car. Do you have any photos of it? I do somewhere, yeah. I hope that we can we can see that car one day. Because <laughs> I know that you were not a car guy, right? Not a car guy, but it was a, a fairly cheap car because it hadn't run in a long time and the guy wanted to sell it. So does it run? <laughs> Just so everybody understands that like when you're selling a car, right, Mike, and, and you're you're buying a car from a guy from New Jersey or New York like you, we have been taught to answer the question with a question, right? So if a guy says to you, hey, does this car run? And you go, does it run? Does it run? Yeah, you got to make it run. run. Make it sound ridiculous. Does it make run? It ridiculous. Run. Does, it, does the heater work in the winter? Does the <laughs> heater work in the winter? Do you have any real questions? <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, is you never answer the question. You just ridicule them for asking the question. Yeah. And then they feel dumb and they stop asking. I think that's the way to go. And basically that is a form of rejection. And tonight's episode, Mike, <laughs> we're going to be talking about rejection. But first, what what's uh, any story behind your hat? For uh, This is a hat, an ice cream uh, hat from a place called Mr. Cone in Monroe, New York, up oh. where I used to live. But mm. it was it was a fantastic ice cream place, but it's out of business now. So Did this they, is the uh, only the only vestige of the ice cream. Oh no, that's so yeah. sad. Yeah, it was a really good ice cream place, and I miss it oh, terribly. Uh, now, Mike, do you have too many tabs open on your browser? Because you finally cleared up. You were like fuzzy there for a little bit. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I have an ant crawling across my keyboard. Maybe that did it. <laughs> And one of those four to six dogs that you have roaming around the house didn't get that dog. So, Mike, we're going to be talking about something um, you and I have experienced a few times. And actually, just today, uh, the reason this topic came up was because, remember, over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about the story I'm working on. We showed Note. If you haven't seen Note yet, you should definitely check that out. Uh, the original publisher... Uh, rejected it the first time. I went back, I fixed it. And thanks to your help, I made it a much better proposal that he then subsequently. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. And, you know, I put the elbow grease into that. Like, yeah, you, you did. You no, know, I, I, I didn't take that lightly. Like, I wanted this thing to go. And so I was, I was disappointed. Um, and as we were trying to figure out what we were going to talk about, um, fresh from the sting of being rejected i just thought let's talk about rejection and why not it happens to everyone even to you mike has anybody <laughs> ever rejected you our i've um, been rejected more times than i can count 
Hold on. This is uh, Mike, <laughs> three-time Emmy award-winning pancake-eating breakfast <laughs> television writer. Those are real Emmys, are they not, Mike? They are the real thing, yes. They are the real deal. So Mike actually has been rejected. I've been rejected many times. Just today, one of my rejections. I feel like I click send and this guy had already rejected <laughs> You get the email rejecting you before it finishes sending. He's like, don't bother. <laughs> I, and I think there's at least two types of rejections. One is the rejection where somebody tells you that they've rejected you. And sometimes they even tell you why. And then there's the ghost rejection yes. where they just literally ghost you. Yeah. Right. Or you, you have, yes, because they refuse. I guess they don't want to actually say they're rejecting you. So they just say, ah, they'll forget about it after a while. I feel like no is a perfectly acceptable answer. Yes. Having grown up hearing no most of my dating life, I feel I was well prepared for being rejected as a professional writer. Yes. No doesn't sting that much when you've had a face like this your whole life. <laughs> it's always better to get the actual no thank you or we're not interested at this time, whatever, just as long as you know that you don't have to just keep waiting on the edge. Even when I was dating, even if I got a... <clears throat> No, at least I got <laughs> the answer. You know what Thank I mean? That's, that's an answer. It wasn't like I wasn't sure there was a possibility. No was no, and I accepted no. But I I, I find it hard to accept the ghosting no, Mike. I don't know about yeah. you. Like when you send something, especially when somebody's like, yeah, send it to me, and then you don't hear back from them. Yes, I've gotten plenty of those. And then I'll usually follow up after a while and be like, hey, so any word on this? And then you'll usually get the no after that. Then, yeah, or I, or I haven't had a chance to look at it. It's been a month. Oh, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. You send it to them because they're all excited to get it, and then you don't hear from them, and you go, hey, what did you think? And they go, oh, I haven't read it yet. Oh, I haven't yeah. read it yet. And you're like, you're a liar. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as always, we put together some slides. Um, I, I know that, Mike, you're probably wondering, how did I come up with such a great graphic? I was I was curious about that. I wondered if you got like a new um, editor in to make these graphics because they're so good. No, no, I I, uh, I went into Photoshop and used the uh, bevel. Uh, <laughs> Somebody has to save us one day, Mike, from uh, from my graphic design. Okay, Somebody. so uh, we did talk about it being Hat Month. Mm -hmm. Hat um, month. So let's get rejected. What do you say? All right, let's go. All right, so we share in good company. Uh, let's uh, hear from uh, one or two different um writers so stephen king in his book on writing it said by the time i was 14 the nail in my wall would no longer support the weight of rejection slips impaled upon it i replaced the nail with a spike and went on writing yeah that's and what you stephen, gotta do well and stephen king talks a lot about you know waiting for the inspiration muse to hit you and you know that's not how it's done professionally yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, it's it's always great when you do get that sudden idea and you can sit down and, and you know, type out 10, 15 pages in one shot. But waiting for it means it's probably not going to come. You just got to give it a little a little poke to get now, it. You're in Hollywood. I, I, I understand that Hollywood's uh, quite a bit different than comic books. They are they have readers, right? who have to read and then give notes and why yeah. they've rejected something. What what what's that all about, Mike? Um, cause the, the, you know, the executives are too busy to read the thousands of scripts they get. So whenever they get a script, they give it to a reader and the reader, you know, obviously reads it and breaks it down into, you know, how the characters are laid out, what the story is laid out. If this makes sense, if that makes sense, they go through the whole thing. And it's, it's good because they will give you at least their thoughts on, on what's wrong with your script. And you don't want to be the person that passed on Pulp Fiction, right? Yes. Yes. You do not want to be that person. But there are there is someone who passed on it, just like the people who passed on Harry Potter or any of those. They all went somewhere. They wasn't they didn't get, you know, accepted on their first shot. They all got rejected multiple times. Well, and, and I think that's really important to note that one editor's interpretation or one reader's interpretation of your work. Uh, maybe based on a number of factors in, in, in comics publishing, they might already have a full plate of books that they know they want to publish through the end of the next year and the following year. And they're looking at this and they're saying, look, I'm holding the door open in case Frank Miller has a, 
another book that he wants to put out and Alex Ross is going to do the covers and you know that they're they're not rejecting your project necessarily but they might just be saying it just doesn't fit into the publishing schedule yeah. and that's a perfectly acceptable reason to be rejected yeah their slate is full i get that one a lot oh, we're, we're we're all queued up for the next you know season or two so it sounds like they throw a, a bag of words at you our queue is pulled up and our slate is full let's shake up the bag of words we're not rejecting you we really love you right bag oh, yeah. of words and as, um, as we talked about in a previous episode when you're in the pitch meeting or whatever everyone loves it yes. everybody loves it yep. everybody loves it they they read it and they're like i love this and then you're like what'd you like about it <laughs> then I got nothing. Let me let me go through it again. Let me go through it again. Hold on. Uh, that was supposed to be ducks. That wasn't uh, that ducks. Was, I, it said ducks on it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think the key thing right now is that we want to share with you uh, at least one other um, one from the comic book world, Neil Gaiman. Um, and this was, I don't know where this is from. Gaiman has, uh, I, and I'll show the, I'll send you a link for all the different places. Would you read this one, Mike? Because I think uh, I read the last one. Because the rejection slips will arrive. And if the books no, with are your British accent, with your British accent. Oh. And if the books are published, then you can pretty much guarantee that bad reviews will be as well. And you'll need to learn how to shrug and keep going or you stop and get a real job. Which I, I think is probably one of the most dreadful things that you can do, Mike, is just try to get a real job, right? Like, yeah, that's, you know, who needs that? Who that's needs a terrible that? idea. <laughs> that's, I, I, that's a lot of effort to put in. That a lot of effort. So I think the key thing is, you know, everybody from Stephen King to Neil Gaiman is rejected. And, and we, uh, you know, because we make up the show about 10 minutes before we go on, <laughs> I didn't have time. But Todd McFarlane talks in his book about how he was rejected many, many times. And it forced his determination to improve his craft and get better at it, which is where I want to go with the next little bit for our audience. Three tips for dealing with rejection. We only have three, Mike, because we've only been rejected a couple of times, so we don't have a lot of experience with it. <laughs> one rejection for each Emmy. <laughs> yeah, I talk about one rejection for each day of the week. <laughs> All right, so number one, accept that the rejection is on the on your work and not as on you as a human um i think people take it far too personally like you you should take it personally you should pour yourself into your work you should love your story you should know your characters it should feel personal if it doesn't feel personal then i don't think you've uh, put enough of yourself into the work but they are indeed rejecting the work yeah. and it's not necessarily an indictment on you that you are an irredeemable human. I, that's my <laughs> perspective on it. What do you think, Mike? No, it's, it's true. I mean, it is on your work. It could just be the person who's reading it just had a bad day and they don't like that. Or it could be that if you're, you're pitching, say, a superhero novel and the you know people in the comics industry are like, eh, we're more into the sci-fi thing now. It might not be exactly what, you know, is bad about your work. It's just might not be right for them at the time. And a rejection doesn't mean that they will never look at your work ever again, um, that they don't want to speak with you. You know, comics is a relatively small business. If you're going to work in comics and you're going to pitch an editor and you go to any convention, there is a chance that you might run into them. And at that point, taking it too personally is just a mark of um, an immature and... Um, maladjusted creator. No one's going to work with you if you take rejection too personally. Yeah. You just got to, you know, essentially suck it up and keep moving on. Like uh, Neil Gaiman and Stephen King said, it's, it's not, as you said, even here, it's not on you as a human. Is that just... right? And, 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 and even tonight, Mike, um, the, the first trivia item that you sent along, I rejected it. You didn't take yes, it personally. You, you just sent me a new one. You were I like, here's another one. I found one. I was like, here's another one. Try this one. 
yeah, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not an indictment. And, and also I think that, um, you know, making it personal to me, when I got the rejection today, I took a moment, uh, read it, understood it, saw what his perspective perspective was as an editor. He actually gave me a nice note about why it wasn't right for their publishing group. And then I responded by thanking him for reading it. Uh, I appreciated the, the honesty and the feedback and, uh, I showed appreciation for taking the time to give me a little bit of, um, information about why it wasn't right for them. And I think that showing mutual respect is really important. Yeah. And that rejection doesn't mean that you can't send it somewhere else. It's not like that one rejection ends everything. You can, you can react in a way that ends everything. Yes. Yes. If you are a complete, um, terrible person and yeah, you're just like, I, I wrote this and it's the greatest thing that's ever been written. So I'll you know, show you yeah, all. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You just, right. you know, you gotta, you do have to develop a little bit of a thick skin and just take it in stride and move on. That's all you gotta do. I don't have a thick skin, neither do you, but <laughs> we accept that the rejection is on the work, not on you as a human. Uh, let's say we go to number two. Um, learn why you're getting rejected, phone a friend, take constructive criticism. So going back to the example that we just used the first draft, I sent it to you. Um, I sent it to Glenn Herdling and I said, what do you think? And we, we discussed what that editor said. And I thought that editor makes good points actually did dramatically change the story and the ending. Uh, it still was not right for him. Uh, but in my response to him, I said, I want to thank you for your initial feedback. It is now the story I want to tell. I, I was forced to dig more deeply to explore the characters. I went back to basics and wrote character profiles. Um, and I, at that point, was saying, like, I get it. I understand. I'm not going to pitch it a third time. And at the same time, I'm not going to change it because the story I want to tell is there now. And... I think he, you know, he was pretty, pretty cool about it. He actually responded. He was like, oh, I'm glad I was helpful. You know, it was great to chat with you. And we left the door open. I took the constructive criticism and I phoned a friend. I don't know. What do you do when you get uh, rejected, Mike? Um, if you, if you get notes, then you really sit down and consider what those notes are. And if you're like you did, when you got a note, you're like, okay, that's actually a good note. Let me change it. So you change it according to what needs to be done. Like, or, and if they said, we'll accept this, if you do this, then go ahead and do that. Or but not, or not. Yeah. Yeah. But generally you sit down, you go over it again, try to, you know, come at it with a clean, clean slate and say, okay, what can I change about this? That might make them accept it. When um, I got, it was interesting, when I was had Hollywood interest in Seven Days to Fame, a comic book series that I wrote, um, they loved it, they loved it, they thought it was great. And the first thing they did was they made changes. Yeah. And, um, you know, Alan Moore is famous for saying, you know, the comic is the comic, I don't care what they do with the movie. And, and I think at the time, I didn't feel that way. I just felt like the comic is the story. Don't change. If you want to make it into a movie, don't change it at which point they were like they were done yeah no but i you know what i you know i look back and i go do i want a movie so bad that i was willing to have them change my story or did i want my story to be my story at that point in my career i wanted the story to be the story maybe now i would feel differently but at the same time you look at it and you say i rejected their changes and the reason was i disagreed with the direction Right. You know, I didn't want it to be what they wanted it to be. And it didn't matter at the end of the day. You know, you can also give rejections that are not personal or mean as well as receive rejection. Yes. And you have to understand that that when someone is reading like someone in Hollywood, especially they want their fingerprints on it as well, because right. if it turns out to be a gigantic hit, they're going to go, oh, this was my idea to do that. So they would rather take some of the credit and change your story from what you want it to be just because they want their own thing. I, I will say uh, I was far too naive at that time. <laughs> I now you just take the check. check. 
I should have taken the check. Yep. It would have been on the screen, and I would have been like, oh, gosh, I hate what they did with that. Yes. But I, I would have worn it on the red carpet. I hate it as I walk to the bank oh, with my bag I full of cash. That. <laughs> uh, uh, I that. I made a mistake. I erred. Um, but, and I think here, I think here's the important thing. But um, it, getting and taking rejection um, has been a learning experience. The way I did it when I was a newer writer and I was younger, uh, <laughs> I didn't take it as well then <laughs> that I do now. Like, I'm just used to it. My when, I, my when my wife was like, oh, you got rejected? I didn't know you got rejected. And I was like, I get rejected all the time. Yeah, again, it's just another day. <laughs> do you know what this career is that I've chosen? <laughs> but I think you can evolve. Like, even if you've uh, done what I did, which was not had a very good approach to it, you can grow. You can grow yes. as a human being. Yes. I, so, I remember, yeah. I remember my, my very first rejection. I had written my first script. And I honestly thought that this was the greatest thing that had ever been written in the history of man. <laughs> and I actually sent it to someone who was a reader at one of the, the movie companies. And they sent me back all these notes basically saying, you know, this needs to change. That needs to change. And it was a rejection. And I was livid. I was like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He shouldn't be in this industry, blah, blah, blah. And I threw the script in a drawer and I left it there for probably a year or so. And then one day I pulled it back out. I said, no, let me just read it again. See how good, how great it was. It was terrible. Wow. So it was awful. And I'm like, thank God he rejected this. Are you going to send that guy a Starbucks card? <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. You just, you get caught up in so much of you because you put so much of yourself into the story, but you also have to realize that your perspective is a lot different than someone else who's coming at it from the first time. Uh, I think that's a really uh, good point uh, that, and that readers are, are trying to, to make their, uh, their name in the business as yeah. well. So they have to find something that they know that their producer wants to produce. So sometimes they say like, this is the tone we're looking for. This is the genre. This is the, type of character or here's the actor actress ensemble that we want to put together and you have i don't know a a, a one room thriller or rather you, maybe you have a you know an epic movie on a space station and they have a one room thriller with an ensemble cast it's just not going to work that's yeah. not what they're looking for so I think it's really important to note that, you know, find out why you're being rejected. If they, if they will tell you, great. Sometimes you're just going to get ghosted. Number three, know that we all get rejected. It's not the end of your career. Um, it's actually the beginning, the middle, and all throughout <laughs> your career. Mike, you are a three-time Emmy award-winning television writer. We talk about it all the time. You still get rejected, right? I get rejected all the time. Yes. I mean, I just had a pitch a couple of weeks ago. We got rejected for it. It's just, it's just, you know, another day you, you fix what you can. And if that person, that studio or whatever still rejects you, you move on to the next one. I think that the sting of rejection changes over time. Yeah. The more you get published, the more work that you put out there, um, the more that you say, okay, if this publisher or this production studio is not that interested, there may be others. And I think the key thing is that I still get rejected. I'm 30 years in this business. Uh, you still get rejected. You've been in Hollywood for years. At a certain point, you just have to understand that this is the nature of this business. That's what it is. That's what it is. You so yeah, you just you don't quit. You just keep going. You you either move on to the next project or you move on to the next place you're going to pitch it to. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we've been able to see over the last couple of years is that uh, Kickstarter has enabled people to say, I'll show you all. Yeah. And then, and then make something that is great. Right. Yeah. There's, there's your, there's your opportunity. And, you know, I think sometimes you just have to be willing to invest in yourself. I have a certain amount of money that I'm willing to lose to tell my stories because they are important to me. And I will do this story, whether it is through a publisher or Kickstarter or whatever, but I'll tell my story and then I will send it to that editor and just say, hey, here's what I ended up doing. Not to thumb my nose, but, 
but rather to say this was what I wanted to do. Now, I might look at it and go, he was right. I might also say, you know, I think the key thing that you have to remember, Mike, as a writer, and probably you're a little bit different in Hollywood because you send a complete script, is I'm sending a proposal. I'm not actually sending the comic. I'm sending not the script. I'm sending a, an outline of the script. And I feel like certain things will come out when I write it. And it is really hard to take what essentially was a 128-page graphic novel and distill it into a four-and-a-half or five-page uh, synopsis. Yeah, it's tough. Tough. But see, if you if you had done the comic first, you know, would that have changed things? Would you know? And you sent it to a publisher, or would they, would they go? Yeah. Would they go? Okay, yeah, this is great because they can see it, or even even a movie movie studio because then they can see the you know the layout of the the graphics and what the characters look like. Would it change it? Eh, it might not. Still might get but rejected. It gives them a lot more clarity over what what it actually is. Yeah. Right? Like I'm asking this person to imagine what I have in my head when, when I get excited about this story and then uh, for the, translate to them over an email. Like we're not sitting together in a room. They're reading a cold read. And I don't know what they're doing while they're reading it. So I think that's a key thing. So, all right. So three things. Um, now let's uh, get to trivia time. Uh, Mike, you picked a, a wonderful piece of trivia that I didn't like at all, but I'm going to allow you to defend why you selected the dot. What, how do you pronounce that, Mike? Diatolov Pass. There you go. <clears throat> There's no fade out on that. It just you, oh, you should you should put one in. Do a little editing. <laughs> All right. So um, I I I want to I want you to tell me about this. Um, this this book. to me is just one of those fantastic mysteries that no one has been able to solve. There's other there's ideas about what happened, but it was nine Russian um, hikers, experienced hikers, went into this pass in the the middle of winter. And they didn't <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're in Russia You're in, in Russia. the middle of winter. Middle of winter. Why does anybody think that this is going to be a good idea? Oh, wait, Glenn Gatilla, the, the devil's pass. <laughs> is that what it's called? It's, I think it's both names, but the, they named it the Dietolov Pass because the leader of the group was named Dietolov. So <laughs> the operative word is was. Yeah. All yeah. right. So. <laughs> So, so they, what happened in the Diatol of Pass? They, they like, went in to this pass and they didn't come out for, you know, two or three days. Yeah. And when they when they finally went and looked for them, they found all this crazy evidence of something that had happened. They had apparently cut their way out of their tent. Some of them had stumbled off barely wearing any clothes. Others were found miles away with one had like his, his chest crushed. Some were like in the bottom of a little stream with like their eyes out. Others had like half their clothes on, half their clothes off. They were huddled under trees. And they I don't know. Better than I thought it was, Mike. I just saw the picture and I was like, I don't know. Oh, it? no. This is, it's like a, it's a huge it's like an this episode. 19, 1959, it's, it was. And they've been trying to collect evidence, figuring out what happened. And there's a, a numerous things. There's some that there was some, um, uh, an alien possibly had done something. There was a possibility that they had, happened upon some sort of like natural um like uh gas thing that had messed with their heads that made them run out of the tent mm. there's there's numerous ones and the latest one is that something like a slab avalanche had scared them enough that they ran out without gathering any of their supplies and then like the guy who had his chest crushed was hit with the some of the force of the the avalanche what do you think mike is it is it supernatural it's or explainable probably explainable, but I always like to, to veer toward the supernatural, that something weird happened, especially that they had to cut themselves out of the tent. Ooh. And, you know, they were all found in such strange, you know, circumstances. Uh, so before we go on to the, what writers should be thinking about, I actually uh, took a screenshot. This was, we'll put the link in the show notes uh, at the end 
Um, what I like about the description is rescuers found the diatel rescuers. I would hardly call them rescuers. <laughs> they didn't do their job very well. <laughs> People who tried to rescue them, but like calling them rescuers is kind of generous, isn't it, Mike? <laughs> That's like calling them the heroes. I don't know. You're, I would you're say rejecting that, the rescuers. I don't know if they're rescuers <laughs> per se. All right. So um, as a writing challenge, I think it's always very interesting to take any incident and then backwards engineering what happened that led to this moment. Like, how did we get here? Exactly. Um, how would you position this as a writing challenge uh, wait, before we do that, let's just see. Uh, Glenn Catilla says, I'm leaning towards hyperthermia, messing with their heads, and then nature took over. So Glenn's going to go with the uh, biological, anatomical, you know, hypothermia did it. But now, Glenn, if you were to write this story, how would you unveil and roll out hypothermia? They don't all get hypothermia at the same time. How many of them were there, Mike? Nine. No, that's a lot of people to get hypothermia at one time. Yeah. Like I would stick like my, my hand up your, you know, in, in to, until my elbow to keep warm. Like I would, I would care less. So Mike, how, how would you as a writer uh, approach a story? Cause I'll have, I'll have a different approach than you. Well, I would, I would take all the evidence that they found and just kind of go backwards from in how they started it and figure out, or at least try to figure out some, some different take than what they've, they've discovered so far. No, no, like, no. I'm, I'm asking you what, what, how would you, what would you do in your story? Oh, I would, I would, you mean like make it, how would I make it crazy or how would I? So if you, if you, if you, if you were going to turn this in, use this as a story prompt, so I'll tell you my, how I would handle it this way. You know what I'm asking. So I would say that the, the nine go there and that there is, it's not supernatural. It is a, an angry, isolated killer, like a serial killer mm -hmm. that isolated himself to protect the world. And he's like, I cannot control myself. And when they show up basically in his backyard, he is not able to control himself and uh, begins to knock them off. But he is beating himself up. He's furious that they did this to him. So that's how I would approach it. Because oh, I like you know, I'm not as into supernatural as you. I, I want like real stabbing. <laughs> Poking and putting fists up things. And well, yeah. I mean, why not? I just had a colonoscopy a couple of weeks ago. I mean, <laughs> there was a camera up there. Yeah, well. All right, so real quick, what's your uh, what's your thought on? Uh, I would what, go with more supernatural thing, like something uh, where they camped. They decided to camp was say an ancient burial ground for aliens that had been here for thousands of years, and the the leakage from their alien craft and their fuel messed with their heads. Ooh, he drove them out into the snow because humans they can't deal with alien stuff. No. And then, uh, as I note, uh, Gatilla says that he says hypothermia makes them all their heads, right? Does hypothermia do that to you? There's something that, that in the story that if you get to a point that you're so cold, your body somehow thinks that it's actually too hot. Mm. So the people that they did find outside in the tent with no clothes on, part of the, you know, the symptoms are they thought they were too hot, so they stripped off their clothes trying to stay cooler when in fact they're freezing to death. That sounds good. It's one of the theories. That is a good theory. Hold on. Let's see. Gatell is going to give us one more. Treat it like that movie, The Last Duel, part one, the aliens did it, then Bigfoot slash Big Feet, and part three, natural cause at the end, bring in some Ro Russian folklore, which like Glenn doesn't really want to narrow down on any one <laughs> thing. Like he That's is going to throw, he is like, Reject this story. It's got everything. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to go with the angry serial killer who purposely isolated. Oh, and then at the very end, leave it open to the audience to decide. That's good. Mm -hmm. That that tests well. Yeah. Um, you're going to go with alien craft that's under the ground, leakage, yeah. drives them crazy. That's what I'm going with. Mike, I think that is great. I'm going to go with people should like, comment, and subscribe. 
and be sure to come back next week when we are better prepared. Uh, we're going to show the old credits, which I have no idea. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to click the button and end. <laughs>